Yeah, beautiful day to come and praise God. And did anyone see the sun sunrise this morning? Wasn't that gorgeous? That pink kind of salmon, it was beautiful. So in the back of your bulletins, we do have some announcements. Um, I don't think other than our time change here and something that Pastor Mike would like to share, I don't have any announcements. Does anyone else have some they'd like to share? Oh, I was muted. Okay, great. Did everybody hear that? Sunday school is going to be up here because of the boiler. So pick a spot wherever you want, and that'll be great. Let's prepare our hearts and minds and souls to meet the living Christ in this place today, who is Emmanuel, God with us. If you would please all stand for number 66, When Morning Gilds the Sky. Our dear, heaven, uh, our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful sunrise that you gave us today. And in it, Lord, we see your beauty, your creation. And as we gather together this morning, Lord, to praise and worship you, 
I pray, Lord, that our minds would be uh, just renewed, that our spirits would be lifted up, and most of all, God, that all of this would bring you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we come to you this morning to worship you, and we pray, Lord, that this morning would bring a smile to your face. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's join in the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. As our children come forward, if you'd like, take a moment and greet one another in love today. How are you today? <laughs> How are you? Happy New Year. <laughs> oh. I'm at school wearing and dawn and I got hooked last time. <laughs> How are you kids doing? There you go. There you go. I think Janice is going to be here. Let me slide this back just a hair. Well, it is great to be with each one of you. We're starting a new year, aren't we? Huh? Oh, your sister's not here yet? So should we wait for your sister? I bet she and Janice went back to get the candle, the acolyte stick. Let's see if they're bringing the, yes, here they come. We'll wait for them to bring the, the acolyte stick in. Now, let me talk to you about why we do this. So see, there's a, she's carrying a light into the church. Now, this will be a hard question. That light stands for a person. We said somebody was the light of the world who came into the world around Christmas. Who was the light of the world? That, Jesus. So when we bring the light in, it's signifying Jesus coming into our midst. And so at the beginning of church, like Kyle is doing now, we bring the light in. That represents the light of Jesus. We light the candles. And then during the service, the stand, candles stay lit, representing the presence of Christ. And then after the service, when we put out the light of the candles, usually we light the stick and carry the light back out. And the reason we do that is we say when we go into the world, like you guys after church, you're going to school this week. You are the light of Jesus wherever you go. So by the way you act and how you talk to people and the things you do, people we hope will see Jesus in you who lives in you. And so that's why we carry the light out at the end of church. That means we're taking the light of Jesus into the world. So thank you, Kylie, for lighting the candles and thinking about that today. Well, let's see what we got in the lunchbox today. Okay, so there's a note here. Three of our church kids turned five this week. On January 8th, Miles Malacker. On January 9th, Kinsley Kaus. And on January 12th, Paige Hartman. It's so neat. They are all so close in age. Well, let's sing happy birthday to Miles and Kinsley and Paige. So what will we do? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear. Let's say friends. Okay? In place of a person's name, we'll say friends. That way it'll be all three. Or should we say dear kids? Which word do you guys like better? Kids or friends? Kids? Okay, kids. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear kids, happy birthday to you. All right. Well, let's see what else is. Oh. 
Is this a maraca? Cha 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 cha. What is this? A telescope. You mean if I look through this, I can see Mars? I didn't see the moon, but I tell you, there's some beautiful colors in there. And you know what happened? When you turn, have you guys all looked through on these? Pass that around and take a look through there. Look up at the lights there and do it. And then turn this guy. So there's little colored stones in there. And when you turn that, it makes a different design. So it's, is it the same every time I pick, you would pick it up and look through it? It's different every single time. Now, do you think that I can duplicate exactly? So like, if I took it now, I could make the exact same design I made before. No, it's going to always be different. It's what we call random. So every time you pick that up, there's a different design. Now, what that makes me think about this week, when you go to school this week and you go to daycare and you play with your friends, will this week be exactly the same as last week? How come? I mean, don't you do, didn't you go to school last week? How many of you went to school last week? Only two days. Okay, so you went to school Friday, right? Thursday and Friday. So I think school on Monday is going to be exactly like it was on Friday. Exactly. Yeah, you're going to go to school. You're going to eat exactly the same lunch. You're going to, your teacher's going to teach you the exact same thing. And you're going to say the exact same stuff, right? Let's say happy birthday. Happy birthday this week, Miles. We heard it was your birthday. We sang happy birthday to you just before you came in. But we hope you have a good week. So this week's going to be, Monday's going to be the exact same day as Friday. Yeah. It's not. So it's going to be different, right? There's new possibilities on Monday. So tell me something good you did on Friday. What was something good you did on Friday for somebody? Can you think of anything good you did on Friday? Did you guys do anything good on Friday? Yes. Okay. He liked going to Jackie's, okay. You know, so you may be, I'm sure you guys, you probably just can't remember the nice things you did, but Monday is a new day of possibilities. You can do new nice things. Every day is a new possibility. It's going to be different than the day before. So this Monday, you have the chance to make that day different than Friday by doing something nice for somebody that you didn't do the week before. So what's something nice you can do for somebody on Monday that will be new and different? What can you do? Right, play with someone at recess that you've never played with before. What else? Yeah, if someone feels left out, make them join in your group, invite them in. What else can you do? Nope, exactly. What else can you do? What else? Hold the door open for somebody. What else? What can you do at home? What can you do at home? Clean? Exactly. What else can you do at home? Come on. It's, wash the dishes. What else can you do at home? How many of you got pets? What can you do? Feed the dogs and cats. Exactly. What else? Oh, fold laundry. Yes. What else? Take care of the pets. Do your chores and maybe do your brother's chore or your sister's chore. You could do your sister's chore, couldn't you? <laughs> so, see, every day is different. Just like picking this up, I never know what the new design is going to be. Monday is going to be a new day. I don't know what Monday is going to be like. It's full of new possibilities. But you can do something nice on that day that's going to make it a great day. So when you look through this, was it beautiful? 
It was beautiful, wasn't it? When you do nice things for other people, that makes their day beautiful. It's like looking through this, because then they see Jesus in each one of you and the things you do. So when you go to school Monday, think about this kaleidoscope and that you can make the day beautiful by doing something for someone and being Jesus to them, okay? By being that light that goes into the world. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for new days. Help each of us to do something nice Monday and make that a beautiful day for someone else. Amen. All right. Now, let's see. Let me give you this. And then, kid, who's a boy that hasn't taken this home in a while? Okay. There you are, buddy. <laughs> Don't forget your treats. Well, I'm excited about our next sermon series that's starting today. We're going to be talking about relationships, uh, relationships of all kinds. What we're going to talk about doesn't just apply to marriage, but it will apply to whoever you are most closely associated to in your life. So actually, I told Dawn Saturday, out of this series, Janice and I are going to get homework assignments that we're going to work on. <laughs> but also out of this series, because Dawn and I spend so much time together during the week and work together, she and I are going to get homework assignments. <laughs> and so as we talk about relationships, this might apply to a relationship to anyone that's living in your home, anyone that you work with, uh, when I was in the funeral business, I had three other partners, and I tell you, being a partner in a business is like marriage. Uh, this would apply to situations of who you work with. It would apply to situations between parent and child. And so uh, this series that we'll be talking about relationships up till the middle of February, so for the next five or six weeks, is going to apply to all areas of our life. The things that we're going to be talking about in the next weeks are going to be more specific things for us to work on, areas to think about in our relationships. But what we're going to talk about today is the foundation for all of this. If we don't do what we're going to talk about today in our message, the rest of it is just noise. This piece today is really the foundation of all relationships. And to be truthful, relationships aren't rocket science. Most of us know what we should be doing and how we should behave towards one another. It's not not knowing what to do that's the hard part. It's actually doing what we know we should do. And today will give us insight in why that is so difficult sometimes. And so in our scripture today, if you want to turn with me to Romans chapter 8, we're going to look through verses 1 through 17. These first four verses uh, kind of set the stage for us, uh, but they're not the main meat of what I want to talk about today. But I, did, I felt like if I deleted these verses and started in verse 5, I'd be skipping something that we need to hear. Um, so here we are, verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, because through Christ, the law of the Spirit gives life and has set you free from the law of sin and death. So what this first verse is talking about, the Spirit of God that comes into us when we ask Christ into our life to be our Lord, to be our Master and our Savior, the Spirit of God sets us free from two things, the law of sin and death. So the first thing that sets us free from this law of sin, what is the law of sin? The law of sin says that if we don't follow God's law and obey everything God says, we deserve condemnation, which results in death. 
Now, how many of us can obey every single thing God wants us to do? None of us can. None of us can obey everything. So the law of sin applies to all of us and carries condemnation from it. And apart from anything else, apart from the presence of Christ in our life, we would be condemned. But the Spirit of God in us sets us free from that. So no longer are you or I under condemnation or under penalty of death. So this is good news, that when we ask Christ to be our Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God sets us free from that penalty. So that's the first thing we're set free from. The second one is death. Now, there's a, a present reality to this and a future reality. The present reality is that whenever I am unkind in a relationship, in a way, that relationship has experienced some sort of death. If I tell an untruth to someone else, because I've told that untruth, there's a piece of death there. There's some dying in that relationship. If I say something that hurts someone else, or I do something that hurts someone else, the pain that person experiences creates a sense of death in their life. So I'm not talking about a physical death here in the present reality, but more of a kind of death that takes us away from abundant life. Anything that diminishes the quality of life. And so the Spirit of God sets us free from that, meaning that when we have the Spirit of God living in us, no longer will we experience death in various areas of our life, but we will experience abundant life if we follow that Spirit. If we follow that Spirit. The future reality is that apart from Christ being our Lord and Savior and the Spirit of God living in us, someday all of us will physically die, and that's not the death we have to worry about, but there is a death that is called eternal separation from God where we all stand before Christ on Judgment Day. And for those who have been found apart from Christ or without the righteousness of Christ, then we are eternally separated from God for all the rest of time and thrown in the lake of hell and fire. And that is the death, eternal separation, the real death that all of us should fear, but that the Spirit of God sets us free from. So we have a present reality, a quality of life that God, of death diminishing our quality of life that God sets us free from today, but also that future judgment he sets us free from. And so this is the good news. For what the law was powerless to do, so the law came to us in the Ten Commandments and God's Scriptures to point out to us how we're to live, but it also showed us the shortcomings of how we sin. And the law couldn't save us. But what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in the likeness of man, each one of us, to be a sin offering. And then verse 4, And so he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Christ, when we receive him as our Lord and Savior, we put on his righteousness. Uh, so the putting on this robe is like putting on the righteousness of Christ. You can no longer see the clothes I'm wearing underneath. When I put on the righteousness of Christ, God no longer sees my sin. Am I still a sinner? Yes. Is that sin still there? Yes. But when we receive Christ, God now sees us as righteous. And that's the requirement to avoid that future death of eternal separation from God, we have to be seen as righteous. And so God sent Christ to us that we might meet that requirement of righteousness. And now we live not according to the flesh or our own desires, but by the desires of the Spirit. So the second section, verse 5 and following, is the most important meat of the Scripture. There are two people in this world based on this scripture. There are people that live according to the flesh and people that live according to the spirit. 
everybody in this world fits in one of those two categories. And this really explains a lot on behavior of people, why they do what they do and why they act the way they do. So if we think about this, a person that acts according to the flesh, what would that be? What would that look like if we act according to the flesh? What does that mean? To act according to the flesh is to do what I want to do. So that's to look out for my best interest above everyone else's. That's to say to Janice, if we're going to eat someplace after church today, I disregard where she wants to go, and we go where I want to go. That would be acting according to the flesh. If she needed me to help out with something at home, I know the Christmas lights need to come off the house. And that may be an afternoon task. And she asked me, you know, do I want to get up on the roof and take the lights down? Not really. But if she asks me, I'm going to this afternoon. So living by the flesh would say, no, I'm not going to do that. You could go do it if you really want it done. I'm going to watch TV. And so acting according, living according to the flesh is looking out for number one, yourself. It's our self-centeredness. It's our sinfulness that leads us in life. And so there are two people, one that live according to the flesh, their own desires, and the second group is those that live according to the Spirit, the Spirit of God. And so the second group does what God wants them to do. And so no longer is it about what I want to do, but it's about what God wants me to do. And so verse 5, it says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit, have their minds set on what the Spirit does. So if I live according to the flesh, what I want all the time, I'm constantly thinking, what's the next thing I want to buy that's going to make me happy? What are we going to do this afternoon that's going to make me happy? What am I going to do at work with my coworker so I don't have to do the dirty jobs, so I get to be happy at work and I'll let her do the dirty jobs? It's all about me. But if I'm living by the Spirit, my mind is set on, what would God want me to do in this situation? So I'm comfortable in my easy chair this afternoon. I've taken my nap. The TV show has come on that I'd like to see, and Janice says, you know what, let's go out and get those Christmas lights off. If I'm thinking about what the Spirit wants me to do, the Spirit's going to say, how can you show love to her? This is important to her to get the lights off today not have them up till April. Which, it's not as important to me. But for Janice, it is. So the Spirit's going to say, you ought to go out there, shut the TV off. You ought to go out there and help take the lights down. Because those who take the lights down together stay together. And so this, that's, there's a difference there. So God says these are two kinds of people in the world. And then verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death. So here we're talking about death of quality of life. When we're governed by what I want, my quality of life in relationships is not going to be good. I may feel like I'm getting the advantage and I'm winning, but the people around me aren't going to be happy. And consequently, if they're not happy, ultimately the relationship isn't going to be good. And I'm not going to have any friends or anybody that really wants to be around me. And so the mind governed by the flesh leads to death or a, a disharmony or disquality in life. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That if we live according to what God wants us to do, we're going to experience joy, peace, love, gentleness, kindness. We're going to have the kind of relationships in life we want. And this is the secret of relationships, is being governed by the Spirit of God and allowing the Spirit to lead us in everything. This is the secret, and this is why all the rest of the sermons that we're going to talk about more specifics, if we're not allowing the Spirit to guide us, everything else we're going to tell you is not going to make a world of difference. This is the secret the foundational secret to good relationships is allowing the Spirit to guide me. 
And so this next piece is amazing, the mind governed by the flesh. So two, part, two kinds of people in the world. Whenever our mind is governed by the flesh, or if that's how we live, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't do what God wants that person to do. It does not submit to God's law. So a mind governed by the flesh says, I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I want to do what I want to do. And the mind governed by the flesh will not submit to God's law. And finally, it says, nor can it do so. Even the mind that is governed by the flesh, it cannot even submit to what God wants it to do. And those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now, I'm preaching to the choir here. Many of you probably believe this. But I tell you what, our world does not believe this. Our world believes that you can live by the flesh, that you don't need the Spirit of God in you to live a good life. Our culture, our world today, believes that you do not need the Spirit of God to be a good person, to be kind and gentle to other people, to have the kind of relationships you want. Our world believes you don't need the Spirit of God to do this. But Scripture here tells us otherwise. Scripture says without the Spirit of God, you cannot submit to God, nor will you, nor can you please God. Our culture believes that we can go into the world, that we can pick up books, and we can read about relationships, and learn what techniques to apply to our lives to have good relationships. And that knowledge is all good. But if we're not willing to submit to God and allow the Spirit of God to guide us, that knowledge will never do anything in our relationships that will make a difference and give us the life we really want. And so when you look at the disharmony of our world and how people treat one another, when you look at it from this standpoint, that there are two kinds of people, those who submit to God and walk by the Spirit, or those who don't submit to God and walk by the flesh, you can now see why people do the things they do to each other. It gives a spiritual understanding of what's really happening in people in our world. And so the real secret here is our willingness to submit to God. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this is why people don't want to submit to God. Why they think going to pick up a self-help book that talks about relationships will solve all their problems. So I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is on page um, 1802 and 1803. And I'm going to look on 1803 at chap verse 18. 1803 verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross is that we each need a Savior, that we are each sinners, that we need to repent and receive Christ as our Savior, that we can't do life on our own, that we need Christ in our life as our Lord, as our Master to guide us. Otherwise, we will live by the fleshly nature. That's the message of the cross. It's a submission that we need a Savior, and it's a submission that we need a Lord. And so it says the message of the cross is foolishness. That sounds foolish to people who are perishing. Those who are perishing is everybody in the world who will not submit to God and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Everyone, no one that's apart from Christ will live. They are all perishing. And so this message of submission, of needing a Lord and a Savior, sounds foolish to people. And it's for that reason that they think they're wise. They think they know better. So it says, but those of us who are being saved, it is the power of the God that the message of the cross, that we need a Lord and Savior, is the power that lives within us, and we see it differently. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where's the wise person, God says? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God and the world through its wisdom did not know him, so the world, Christ came into the world, even though he entered into people's lives, there were people standing right there that didn't recognize him, their creator. And the world thought, we're wise, we're smart, we don't need God. Even though the world did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And then I'm going to jump ahead to verse, um, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Chapter 2, so flip over one page to 1804, verse 4 and 5. Paul says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and per persuasive words. So the gospel is not something that's hard to grasp. It's simple. The gospel is not about using big words and trying to entice people, but it's a simple message. And with that gospel is a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So when we allow the Christ to come into our life and ask Him to be our Savior, and we ask Him to be our Lord, we begin to love and live in amazing ways. No longer do we think about ourselves, but we think about what God wants us to do. And when people look at us, that life speaks power to other people. And it shows the power of the gospel. And it does this so that in verse 5, our faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And this is the problem with our world today. Our world thinks it can solve all of our problems with human wisdom. We think that we can go to the bookstore and pick up a book on relationships and that we will have the relationships we want. We think that as a nation, we can sit down and figure out plans for our security and plans with coexistent with other nations in the world and that we have the wisdom to have the kind of world we want. And God tells us right here in Scripture that our wisdom that we think will lead to the ultimate life we want is foolish. It is empty. And it all comes down to submission to the Spirit is the secret. And so in verse 11, or verse 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. All of you here are desiring to live by the Spirit. But you're in the realm of the Spirit. If endeared, the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subjected to death, even though we die physically, because of the Spirit, or because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of the righteousness of Christ that lives in us and has been put on us. And then verse 11, this is the great promise. <clears throat> and if the Spirit of Him, the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, so He's stating an amazing fact that we'll celebrate on Easter. When Christ was laying in the tomb, His heart had been pierced, His lungs had been pierced, His brain is no longer functioning, the Spirit of God came in there and gave life to this dead, lifeless body and raised it from the dead. The Spirit of God did that. And he says, if that Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is living in your mortal bodies, he will also give life to you. So he will give life to your mortal bodies because of this Spirit who lives in you. So this is the secret, that when we ask Christ into our life and we say, I want to do what you want me to do, God. I want to live the life you want me to live this afternoon, tomorrow, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. When we ask God to do that and lead us, his spirit will begin to live through us. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will lead us in doing the thing that will make our relationships awesome. Where we'll repair relationships, where we will no longer look at self, where we will willingly... When we get home, I'm going to say to Janice, hey, let's go do the Christmas lights. And honey, you stay in here and stay warm. I'll go out and do the lights myself. 
<laughs> and they know I was fibbing a little bit there. <laughs> but the Spirit of God, when it lives in us, it will lead us into doing amazing things. And this is the secret and the power that you have. And this is why all the books we read and everything we'd want to learn will not fix our relationships. But this is where our hope is. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. It's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Life will not be what you want it to be. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. So the selfish things we would do, when we live by the Spirit, we put to death those desires and those evil things. And you will live. You will live. You will experience the life you want at work where there are coworkers. It's going to be an awesome week this week, Dawn, because I'm going to put on the Spirit and live in the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so we don't become a slave to God to do things that will hurt us or not be good or that we live in fear, but rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by that spirit we cry, Abba, Father, I'm one of yours. God, I am your child. You're my daddy. You're my father. And so this is the good news. You have the spirit living in you. You have the power to give you the relationships you want at home, at work, in your time of leisure. And this week, I hope as you follow the Spirit's leading in your life, that you will experience some wonderful relationships wherever you're at. God wants that for each one of us. He wants us to live and experience life. You will live this week. Experience it to the fullest. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your amazing Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And Lord, this week when our flesh wants to rear its ugly head and we're tempted to follow those leadings, Lord, we pray through your Spirit that you would guide us, that you would put those misdeeds to death. And Lord, that you would lead each of us in an awesome way this week in all of our relationships, that our lives would be full of love and joy and peace. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. I'd be more inclined to ask the Spirit to ask God to convince Janice that I needed to watch TV and uh, nap. So that's the way I would have worked that one. So if you would please join with me in response to the word in hymn number 442, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty, thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence a healing stream doth flow. Let the fiery cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, did my anxious fear subside.
Let's join together in uh, the Apostles' Creed, number 627. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. You come, come again, again to judge the living and the dead. I believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit, Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the, Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, sins the, the resurrection of the body, body and the, the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Our communion table is open to all. If you earnestly repent of your sins this day, and desire to receive the forgiveness of Christ, if you want God to be your Lord, if you want Christ to lead you in all you do, then you are invited to this table to receive the living Christ. We believe as we partake of these elements of the bread and the wine, that as we receive those, that spiritually Jesus is in those through the Holy Spirit, that we are partaking of the living Christ into us by the Holy Spirit, and that our bodies are being nourished. So that sinful flesh is put to death, and the Spirit of God gives us life. So today, as we come to the communion table, receive life through Christ this day that will enter into you. On the night in which Christ was about to be betrayed, he took bread, a simple element on the table, and he raised it to the Father, and he gave thanks, and he broke that bread before the eyes of his disciples and he said to them, this is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he raised it to the Father and he gave thanks for the cup of wrath that he was about to drink, the wrath that we deserved, he took upon himself. And he said, as often as you drink this, you proclaim not only my death, but also my resurrection. It reminds us that we will receive life until he comes again. So today, as our ushers come forward, they will bring to you the elements of bread first. As you receive that element, just hold on to the bread, and then everyone will be served the cup. Once we've all been served, then we will partake together. May you receive the life that Christ wants to give you today. Amen. And... Uh, Dawn will have gluten-free bread. If you would like to receive gluten-free bread, just catch her attention as she walks around the sanctuary.
May we receive now the living Christ through the Holy Spirit who gives us life. And as we receive these elements, know that the misdeeds have been put to death and we have now been empowered to live and live abundantly. Amen. Know that each one of us are now forgiven. We are seen as righteous, not because of our own deeds, but because of Christ and his forgiveness. Go from this place knowing that you are new creations this day, living a new life. Amen. So as we uh, partake in the body and blood of Christ, he becomes part of us. And as we share our concerns here as a congregation, as his people, we become part of each other because we share each other's burdens. Um, on the back of the bulletin there, we do have prayer requests, Nicole Murbeth, as she continues her treatments for her, for her kidney so that it would not be rejected. And Joel Barnes, as he continues his uh, cancer treatments, um, I do have one that I would like you to write down. Uh, Joe Myers, who is Ken Mall's son-in-law, had a heart attack last Thursday and is not doing well. So please pray for Joe Myers. Are there others that you would like to add this morning? Uh, Brian Borman called me and uh, this morning asked that we'd pray for a fireman's family in Clinton who lost his life uh, as a fireman this past week. So pray for a fireman's family in Clinton. A fireman in Iowa City is in the hospital from an explosion. You know, there's, there's nothing better than the resources of our young kids as they grow up uh, to follow Christ and the opportunity that we have to share with them and help to uh, pave that pathway for them. So I'm sending out a call for anyone who's interested in helping with uh, children's Sunday school. Uh, from two through uh, elementary school, we're going to have a meeting at seven o'clock on Wednesday night. I know that the school calendar is packed and some of you can't be there. You can let me know. Uh, but if you're interested in doing music or in helping teach one 
one day out of the year or, or doing anything, please come as we try and organize for the new year so we can get our kids off to a good start. Wednesday at 7, a meeting here. Okay. Any other? Any others you'd like to lift up? No? Okay. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer as a group of people as we bring these, uh, these people on our prayer request before him today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you know our hearts, and uh, God, we're not keeping anything from you. And our hearts come to you uh, with thankfulness uh, for your seasons, Lord, the beauty of those. Thankfulness that we can come together here on our own power and that we choose to come and worship you. Thankfulness, Lord, for your healing that you've done in many people that have graced the back of the bulletin, Lord. Much healing that you've, uh, you've done, and we thank you for all of that. God, we thank you for our little ones in Sunday schools and, and um, the different classes we have. And uh, Lord, what a, what a wonderful problem that we have that um, we need teachers for these little ones because we have so many that we had to divide the classes up. And God, I pray for your spirit today to speak to that uh, person, to speak to the people, Lord, um, right now that you would lay it on their hearts, the desire to make a difference in a child's life be it a man or a woman, a younger or older person, Lord, it doesn't matter. If they have a concern for our little ones, Lord, your little ones that you've put in our care, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them right now and that you would encourage them to come to the meeting Wednesday night to see what we as a group can do for these young ones. Because, Lord, it does take a village to raise a child. And, Lord, help us all to be a part of that village. Lord, we do lift up Joe Myers uh, as he um, is dealing with this heart attack, Lord. Uh, Lord, that you would see him and that your healing hand would touch him. And Lord, if physical healing is not to be, I pray, Lord, for spiritual healing. And for the family around him as they gather around, Lord, that you would comfort them. And Lord, that your spirit would be abundant in their life. Lord, I do lift up the firemen that have been injured on the job, one, one killed and one injured, Lord, and that you would see their hearts, that um, the heart of a desire to help their fellow man. And Lord, that's what it's about here on earth is that we help each other. And Lord, sometimes in the line of that duty, people are injured and killed. And God, I know that's not your plan, that death and injury is not your plan, but things happen. And in that, Lord, we beg for you to come and to heal and to comfort. And God, we ask for your protection on all of the firemen and paramedics around the world that um, just help their fellow man, that put themselves aside that moment, that those that leave their families, leave their jobs, leave what they're doing, and come to rescue people. And Lord, that's what the message was about, Lord, was putting you uh, first in our lives. And it's that spirit that they have, Lord, that causes them to leave what they're doing and do your work. And God, uh, we ask all of this, all of this healing, Lord, in your son's precious name who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed <coughs> be thy name. Thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our offering scripture today uh, comes from, uh, Philipp uh, is it Philippians or Philemon? We have Phil. Philippians. Philippians. Philippians, Philippians 4.18, which says, uh, The gifts you gave, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And sometimes we don't think of that. We just think of it as a duty. This is just what you do. Since you were little on, you were putting a quarter in the plate. But you know what? This is pleasing to God. It's that fragrant offering to him. So as the plate is passed today, look at it as a new, a new, uh, a new adventure, a new um, offering to him, one that is fragrant and acceptable. If our ushers would come forward, we'll receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
all rise for the doxology, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our dear gracious Lord, we bring you these fragrant, fragrant offerings, Lord, these sacrifices that are pleasing to you. And God, I ask that you would use it for the building of your kingdom here in the Carroll County and worldwide as you, Lord, can turn uh, turn yuck into glory, Lord, turn uh, things around. I just ask, Lord, that you see these gifts and that you would multiply them for your good and for your glory. In your son's name, amen. amen. Let's share in number 492, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Following our service here, uh, grab coffee and refreshments in the narthex, and then your Sunday school classes. Uh, if you would, find a location in the sanctuary in the narthex or at the tables in the back for your Sunday school class to meet because the rooms are cool downstairs. I think the kids will be okay upstairs probably if they want. Uh, but let's receive the blessing of God. May the love of Christ go ahead of each one of you this week. May God's hand be upon you and hold each one of you. And may through the communion of the Holy Spirit, may we be set free to enjoy life as God gives it to us this week. Amen. Can I hold your hand? Oh. <laughs> when peace never be afraid God will go with you each hour of every day go now in faith steadfast strong and true know he will guide you in all you God bless you this week. You bet.